Hey Poncho, welcome to uh, our uh, interview uh, series that we're making with a couple of uh, Mopark artists. And first of all, I want to I want to thank you man for all the the support you've gave me. It's been more than four years now that we're uh, working together. Mm. And I remember four years ago uh, when I had a, a phone call from uh, Chalo, uh, I mean um, Chris Hart from uh, Remo, uh, telling me uh, that uh, a, an artist was trying to uh, to reach uh, reach us, you know, reach out with Moper. And then I found out that it, it was you. And, um, you know, a couple of weeks after we already were talking on the phone and uh, you were uh, already helping me and, you know, giving me advices and thing like, things like that. So thank you very much, Poncho. Thank, oh, thank you, Francis. It's an honor and a pleasure to be with you. And, uh, uh, and yeah, don't forget about Joe Sevilla, man. Joe Sevilla is the one that actually showed me uh, about your drums. And I had forgotten that 20 years before that, I had met Michelle yeah. uh, in, in Canada. I forgot about that. Uh because I thought I'd never seen the drums or played them. And then Michelle, when I went when I went to the factory uh, uh, in Danville, uh, he reminded me, no, Poncho, remember I brought those bongos? And I said, oh, man, now I remember, you know? <laughs> and then he also seen me play at the, the Montreal Jazz Festival, too, you know? So that was way back when. That was, like, at least 30 years ago, you know? Maybe longer. And so it's, uh, it's really great that uh, now we're, we're family, and I'm very excited to be with uh, the great company of Moperk. And and every uh, every time I turn around, you're you're doing things better. Things are growing. Things are getting more uh, done quicklier now. And because I remember the very beginning, it was you by yourself. <laughs> well, I felt sorry for you, but you used to work from sun up to sundown. You know what I mean? So I'm glad that things are coming together a lot better for you. Well, that's a proof that, uh, you know, collab collaboration is not just about business. It's about uh, friendship. And personally, you know, I, when you look at this, so many great things that are happening and have happened to me go to to, Los to California, to Los Angeles with you guys. Uh, Joe Sevilla became one of my, my best friends. And we've been to Remo, we've been to the motherland, we've been to many places <laughs> together. And that's just the beginning, man. So I'm really, really happy. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Hey, Poncho, my first question is, uh, what message uh, do you want to share through your, your drumming, through your music? You've been doing this for a long time. And what's the most import important thing you want to share with people when you play? Well, for me, uh, Francis, I think that uh, uh, it's important to me. I, I never got into this business to be famous or to be rich because most jazz artists are not rich. You know what I mean? And I'm, I'm considered a, a Latin jazz artist. And we do a little bit of salsa music also and a little bit of soul music, too. But that's just part of my life. But um, the basic message to get across, uh, I've been playing for many, many years. I started playing when I was like uh, at like in 10th or 11th grade in high school. Uh, I just turned 71 years old last month. So I've been doing this a long time, you know? And so uh, I love the, the, the sound of the conga drums and the timbales and the bongos ever since I was a little boy. And so as I got older and got into high school, I, was, I finally bought a, Uh, between me and my father, we, he I bought one conga and he bought the other conga. We bought them brand new in a pawn shop in Norwalk in the, in the small city I live in, in the Los Angeles County. And and they were just cheap congas from Mexico. Uh, I think Joe told me they were called La Paz or La Palma or algo así. And, and they were not very good congas, but they were brand new. You know what I mean? So, and I had two congas, so I tuned one high And one low, that's all I knew. I, I, I didn't know too much more than that, you know. But um, uh, from from that day on there, when I play, it feels good, first of all, just to play the drum. The drum, it felt it felt natural on my hand when I hit the drum. Once I learned to, to get the pop or the slap, pop, it, it felt natural on my hand. It just fell in place. And then, of course, the open tone, 
dun dun, pa, dun dun. Once once I felt, I actually felt it in my body that that I hit the thing right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And from that day on, and and it only took it, it took me about a, a week to figure that just to get that, those two sounds out of the drum. And uh, and 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 uh, uh, you know, thinking about, it, I guess that was pretty fast to 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 get that those two good sounds out of the drum. So from that moment on. I love the drum. I love the way it made me feel. And it's important that but people know that the conga drum, the drums have a spirit. They have a spirit in them. There is a soul there. And and if you respect it and, and treat it, uh, uh, treat it uh, correctly, it can develop into where I'm at today. The, the drum is alive, you know. Once again, especially especially your company, Moperk, you guys are using natural wood, real wood drums with real quite a, uh, rawhide heads. It's and then the most the most important thing I like also the thing that's very important to me is you use stainless steel. That is stainless steel will last forever, you know. So all these things are important to me, and and. Uh, like I'm saying, the drum has a soul, it has a spirit, and if you treat it correctly and nurse it correctly, it will grow with you and 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 it'll never let you down. And, and, and even in bad times when you feel low and down, you can play the conga drum and it brings you up. It, it gives you good energy. So yeah. to me, all those things are important. Then to play for a crowd, to play for an audience. Of course, when I first started, they were small little crowds young people, you know, and then it started growing into bigger crowds, older people. And nowadays I play for everybody. I play for every race, color. I played in uh, many, many different countries from Thailand to Japan, to Africa, to Mexico, wherever, you know, we've played all over the world. And, and, and to see the, to, to see and feel the satisfaction I get and to see the people on the other end, they're getting satisfied also because the natural uh, excitement and feelings and the spirit and the soul of the drums comes out and it makes everybody happy. You know, yeah. I got to tell you a story that it happened more than once to me. I was back east somewhere at a concert and we, we played the concert in, I think it was in Philadelphia and we were at a big concert hall. And it was on a Friday night, and I played. And after I performed, Larry Sanchez, who was my sound engineer for like 35 years, he came up to me and said, Poncho, there's a guy out, th out there, and he's asking if he can meet you. And this is after my concert. People were leaving the concert hall. They were leaving. And I, I said, uh, what does he want? He, says, he just wants to talk to you. And I said, okay, bring him in. So he brought him to my dressing room. And it was a guy, he said, Poncho, thank you so much for allowing me to talk with you. He goes, you don't know me. You don't know me. And I said, no, I, I don't know who you are. You know. He goes, but I just want to tell you one thing. You know, I, I started a new job a couple of weeks ago, and I got a boss who's been horrible with me. He says, he's been writing me for two weeks. He said, man, I, I need the job, and I got to stay there. But he's been on my ass for two weeks. He goes, I bought these tickets to come and see you a month ago. I was so frustrated. He goes, I was not going to come to your concert, even though I had tickets already. I was not going to come because I was so frustrated and so depressed with this new job that I started. He goes, but I somehow I, I got myself together and I went to your concert. He goes, Poncho, I just want to thank you. This is the best concert I ever been to, and I you I was so depressed when I walked in, and I'm happy as can be, and I don't care nothing about my boss right now. <laughs> <laughs> so that that's the spirit, that's the soul, of the energy, the positive energy of a drum, you know. So and that happened more than once to me. So it lifts your soul, lifts your spirit, and so these are things that are important to me that. The audience that is receiving this, that they're happy and they leave happy, and so I think I've uh, I've done pretty well with that. Yeah, 
Well, uh, I guess that's you. You already answered my next my next question because it it also have to see with your uh, what keeps you motivated to uh, to continue doing this because you could you could probably just say oh I'm gonna now I've played enough I'm gonna retire but there's more than you know more than business or a, it's more than a business or a job for you 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 need to keep playing to keep this thing alive like, to keep receiving and, and transmitting this vibe yeah it's yeah you're right and, and that's exactly right uh i can stop playing if i wanted to you know i mean i, I thank the the lord above that that me and stella are well, well off enough to where i could stop playing if i wanted to you know but uh Uh, I, I can't right now, I, I, and I won't because, uh, like I mentioned, I'm 71 years old now. I mean, most people retire by now, you know what I mean? But I still feel well enough, I still feel healthy enough to perform still. Now, I've told my management that I want to slow down. I'm only doing two or three gigs a month now, where before I was working five days a week, traveling to the air from one airport to the other airport all over the world i did that for about 45 years yeah and, and it's a lot you know it's a lot i think about 43 years i've been doing that traveling mm -hmm. so i'm trying to slow things down a little bit i'm hand picking the gigs that i like the festivals that i like and and trying not to do too much traveling in an airplane because i traveled all over the world many many times for many many years And uh, you're absolutely correct. Uh, the fact uh, of the spirit of the drum, the the feeling I get from playing drums, that's what keeps me going. And the the uh, satisfaction that I I get from seeing the audience being satisfied when I perform, that all helps me stay strong and, and proud. And and so therefore, uh, 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 that's why I continue going. And then of course for me uh, personally. I like all the old uh, style of uh, playing, like the early rumba stuff from the 50s and 60s and that Mongo, Santa Maria would do, Rey Barreto, uh, Tataguines, uh, Patato, uh, 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 people, like, people like that. I, I like that old traditional style of the rumba, the Wawanko and all that. And then I like the, the traditional uh, salsa music from the 50s, 60s, 70s. That period I really liked a lot, you know, the Ray Barreto's band and 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 and, and the Fania All Stars and that I really liked that period, Johnny Pacheco, all that stuff. I I really liked that. You know, I followed Johnny Pacheco from when he first started with the Charanga sound and the Charanga style in the 60s into where he went into the conjunto sound with the trumpets and and changed the style a little bit. You know, I followed that whole career. So those are the things that are important to me musically. As well as Latin jazz, Cal Jader, Willie Bobo, Mon Santa Maria, uh, people like that. Uh, I, I follow all those traditions, and that's why I, I keep my band in the traditions of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. That's the tradition and style that I like, you know. So all these things keep me going, and I have a big collection here at home. I'm in my music room here, and and I have all the early collections of all the records and CDs and DVDs and even old uh, uh, videos and everything. So that's what keeps me going for now. And I thank the Lord that I'm healthy enough to still perform right now. I still feel good. That's great. Uh, I mean, you're answering all my questions and in, 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 with, within your stories because you have so much to, uh, to tell and so much to explain. And I mean, it's priceless to, uh, to, uh, to hear you um, explaining all the all the all the all these stories and by the way I don't, i'm not sure we can talk about it but that's the probably the reason you're you're currently writing a book yeah yeah no the that's what i'm uh, I'm, uh thank you francis that's what i'm doing right now uh there's a gentleman by the name of ruben hernandez who just so happens to be from laredo texas where i'm from and i didn't meet him in laredo his family from laredo actually his father used to work for my father because my father had a dry cleaners business in the uh, late 40s and early 50s in Laredo, Texas. And his father worked for my father in the cleaners. But but then we moved to California and I, I never, I didn't know him in, in Laredo, Texas. 
And he came to one of my concerts, and we found out it was a small world. Uh, his father worked for my father. And so we got along ever since then. I, and I met Ruben Hernandez about, oh, about 30 years ago. And I didn't know he could, he had a license to write books. You know, I didn't know that. I knew he was a school teacher and, 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 and worked with the school districts and, and whatnot. But uh, I didn't know he had a, a, a authority to write a book. And one day he told me about, it's been about four months now. He told me four months ago, he came to one of my concerts, Poncho, have you ever thought of writing a book? And I go, yeah. Uh, has anybody offered you to write a book? I go, yes, several times in the last 30 years. I said, but I've always said no, because it's, it's a hassle to write a book. It's a lot of work, you know? And I told him, you know, uh, my management's, I've had, two different major management teams with me. Both of them asked me, Poncho, you need to do a book. And I said, no, nah, I don't want to do a book. Why? Because you're going to get some guy from New York to call me seven times a week or five times a week, and I'm going to be on the phone. Well, now we could do Zoom, but in those days, you, it was just phone, you know? And the guy's going to be bugging me every day, and I won't even know who this guy is, and he's going to be getting in my business. And I said, no, no, no. I would get bored in a week and say, forget it. I don't want to do it. But when Ruben asked me, he's a friend of mine. He's almost, he's like family. And I, I told him, I didn't know you knew how to write a book. He goes, Poncho, I would love to help you write a book. Man, I haven't turned back since. That was four months ago. We have, uh, he told me last night, we did a Zoom last night. He told me we have 40, 46 stories. That, that means 46 chapters in four months. So this thing is moving along like a steamroller and it's coming along better than I thought. And I'm, I'm excited every day to tell Ruben another story, you know? So we're very excited about the book. It'll probably be out like late next year, uh, 2023, because there's still a lot of work. We got to put pictures. They got a, uh, uh, Ivory Daniel, my manager is going to have to find somebody to put the book together. Uh, mass produce it and then also distribute it so there, there's a lot of things involved so i would think by the by this time next year the book should be out so i'm very very excited about that so that's one thing i've been very busy with as well as performing with my band and being part of moper uh congas what a great idea uh i think it's the best thing you can do because just like your your music, a book will stay forever for the next generations to come. And that's that's a legacy you're leaving to uh, the music industry and the and the Latin percussion scene and and I mean it's it's that's that's very important, I think. So uh, that's that's also part of, of the first question. You're you know, you're gonna that's the best way to share your experience uh, with 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 everybody. And um, can't wait, can't wait to read it. <laughs> Thank you, man. Of course, you know you you got a book. I'll send you a couple of them, man, when they're done. But uh, yeah, uh, it's it's coming out uh, excellent. I'm very very proud to say that Ruben Hernandez and myself and my manager Ivory Daniel, we're putting this thing together, and, and we're we're hoping to have it out by uh, late next year. So now, Poncho, um, I know you've been working with many great producers, artists. Uh, red record company. You've done uh, what about 30 records with uh, one of the greatest uh, jazz record company, uh, Concord Records. Uh, so you've you've been in touch with many uh, important people in the business. And my question is, what what's the best advice you've received from in, in your musical career? Well, you know uh, that's a pretty difficult uh, question, Francis, but. Uh and the other thing is, it's important to to remember, is that when I first started out, it, it's much different than it is today. So I, I can only tell you the way I did it. But when I first started out, uh, I was lucky enough to learn to play the, the drums well enough to where I got the gig with Cal Jader, which was that was a dream come true for me, because my older brothers and sisters had the early Cal Jader recordings. They would see Cal Jader play in Los Angeles when I was a little boy. So for me to end up playing with Cal Jader was a dream come true for me and for my brothers and si older brothers and sisters 
they couldn't believe that I actually got the gig with Cal Jader. So that was a blessing in itself. But through Cal Jader, I also uh, got to meet Claire Fisher, the great pianist. Claire Fisher was a harmonic genius, and he was a great pianist and worked with everybody in the business, and a great composer, writer, conductor, everything. And uh, he got me my first record contract with Discovery Record, the Discovery Record label, Albert Marks, here in Hollywood. And I did my first two records with uh, Discovery Records, and I learned a lot on those first two records how to put a band together. And of course, at that time, I was in the Cal Jader band. So I was still in the Cal Jader band when I recorded those two records. And I, I learned a lot by watching Claire Fisher, Cal Jader. I also met Mongo Santa Maria and got very close to Mongo, uh, Tito Puente, Willie Bobo. And I, I used to ask them questions all the time when I would perform with them. I, I either played with their bands or they played with my band or they played with Cal Jader's band. So I knew all these great uh, giants in person. And so I would ask them questions. So I uh, developed a lot of knowledge through, through the masters. Uh, I didn't learn too much out of a book. And especially in those days, they didn't have many books about conga playing and Latin jazz. They really didn't have much in those days. Uh, uh, 1970, 71, I joined Cal Jader Band in uh, 1975. So there was not a lot of stuff to learn about all this stuff. But I learned through them. And so it's important that I, uh, Cal Jader also got me the record contract with Concord Records six months before he passed away. So I already had a contract with Concord. I'm still in Cal Jader's band. And then he passed away in Manila in the Philippine Islands of a heart attack. But he had already signed me with Concord Records. And as as of today, I've done, um, I think, uh, 27 or 28 albums with the Concord Picante Recording Company. So you're absolutely correct. I've learned a lot through all these years and all these records uh, since 1975, when I joined Cal Jader's band, till today, and you're absolutely correct. You, uh, on my records, you can hear Eddie Harris on my records, Diane Reeves are on my records, Monga Santa Maria's on my records, Tito Puentes on my records, uh, Chick Corea's on my records, uh, 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 Ray Charles is on my records, Billy Preston is on my records. I mean, it's a, a uh, Sam Moore from Sam and Dave, soul music. It's a wide variety of different artists that are guests on my record. And I learned something from every artist and feature them on my record. So it, it, it's um, it's been a long haul hmm. and it's been a very promising uh, life and career. And I've been blessed uh, to perform, meet, and know all these people that I mentioned and more. Uh, so uh, it's been great. But uh, uh, to, to, to tell a young person today, uh, it was very different coming up the way I did. Uh, but the most important thing I would say to a, a young and upcoming musician is, number one, you got to know your instrument, whatever instrument you play, you have to know it very well. Excellent, as a matter of fact. You got to know your instrument very, very well. Myself, I never learned to read or write music and I do not advise anybody to try to do this without learning to read and write music because it's only going to be harder for you. You, you have a good chance of failing if you don't go to a school, get private lessons, learn to play piano, learn the whole score, how to put a chart together, how to read music. That's the way you have to go. Don't try it like me because it's going to be too hard. I was very lucky and blessed. And then... You have to know that very well. And nowadays, there's there's a lot of stuff that you can learn on the internet. But be very careful because there's a lot of stuff on YouTube that's not right either. So you got to be very careful what you pick and choose to listen and to learn from. And then uh, if you do have, if you do do well enough to put your own group together or your own ideas together, well, now you have to have uh, a way to write charts out, do arrangements, ideas. It has to be all on paper so the other musicians who perform with you have a chart in front of them. Yeah. So you either got to have somebody helping you with that, which I do, uh, Francisco Torres, 
uh, uh, Mark Levine, Charlie Otwell, David Torres, they all helped me oh. to write my charts out and my ideas. But thank God I had a lot of, I have a lot of ideas. You know, you gotta have ideas, new fresh ideas to approach new music. But so it would be better if you just do it yourself. So you gotta learn how to do that. That way you don't waste time with, you don't have to deal with nobody else. Do it yourself. And so you gotta have that in, in order. And the other part is you gotta get a good management team. It's gonna be hard to manage yourself. Yeah. You get a, a professional management team, they know the movements, the ways to go to build your career. And and last but not least, if you have a group like I have, I have a, a nine piece group, well, you gotta travel all over the world with nine people. You better make sure you have somebody helping you get good airline tickets because that's a whole nother story. Hotel rooms and everything. Hotel rooms, <laughs> the, the, trans, the ground transportation, I mean, it, it, the list goes on and on. It's not easy, but you can do it. If I did it, you can do it, you know? So these are some of the important things I would think about if I was going to put a group together. Now, a lot of people, what they do to save money and and to, to help them in their career is they'll hire a band, say, if I'm going to play in New York or, or, or in Canada or something, they'll hire a band there, and then they'll come in as a, as a, as a leader and yeah. rehearse them, and then they'll perform with them. And that's good if you want to do that. But I never liked that because having your own band, your own unit, your own way, very well rehearsed, it's going to sound much better than getting a pickup band somewhere else. Because a lot of people do that, and it ends up being a jam session on stage. I don't do jam, jam sessions on stage. I have charts, I have tunes, and I, I, I can perform... Uh, I can perform for two or three weeks without even repeating a song. I have over uh, 200 tunes in my traveling book right now. Great. And I have a repertoire. Yeah. And, and I have another set of books here at my home with about 150 tunes. <laughs> I have over 300 tunes to choose from. So you got to have material. So you won't play the same show every night after night after night after night. You're going to have to play the hits. You know, you have to, but you want to. To keep yourself uh, happy and, and, and alive, you want to do new things and different things uh, every other night. You know what I mean? That's for sure. Well, personally, the, the one of the greatest advice I, I, I received were, was from you. One of the first time we talked on the phone, you, you said, Francis, you got to take it one step at a time. And a, a short phrase like that, one step at a time, for me means a lot. It means, Francis, stop working 12 hours a day. <laughs> Francis, start enjoying, your, you know, enjoying yourself, uh, and take take breaks and and just yeah. you know, chill and 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 take care of your of your family, right. and and get healthier because you can't do it. And and then that that's part of what you you just said. If you don't have a team with you, and you want to do everything by yourself, you can get or real tired or miss something somewhere. Exactly, and, and and then the worst thing about you could get sick, uh, stress. You know what I mean? Uh, it, stress is uh, not good for you. You know, so you got to be careful because you could end up in the hospital because it was too much for you. You know, then what? Now what are you gonna do? You know what I mean? Yeah. So you take it step at a time, work on it, try to get people that uh, that gather around you like family, uh, people. Even if it's just one more person that person could help you a great deal and you can bounce off each other and ideas. That's how you do it. I, yeah. I did that with my wife, Stella. Uh, we, we just celebrated 50 years of marriage in July. So my wife, Stella would help me a great deal uh, to calm me down when I get upset over something or the, uh, a musical director that in my band, I had uh, Charlie Otwell as a musical director for 12 years, David Torres for 20 years. And now Francisco Torres, the musical director, I, I bounce a lot of things off of my musical director. What do you think about it? You know, that way you have different uh, two people thinking about it, not just one. Exactly. And then, and then the, I think the key is organi get organized because when things, if things are not organized, is it's really hard to uh, to give uh, work to people around you. 
you know, because right. uh, you, you don't know how. You, you know you got a lot of work, but you know you're not organized enough to give part of your of your job to other people. So so I think that if you put everything together, organization, uh, take your time and 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 be you know on top of it. You know a lot of courage and and a lot of uh, you. You have to. Yeah. You have uh -huh. to be, and then and then the the people you choose to to be in your group, you have to be careful because you know some people could uh, mess up your group, you know, or your 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 thoughts or your career. You know what I mean? So you yeah. have to be careful, you know, because there's uh, there's good and bad out there all over the place. So you have to be careful. But I I think with those things said, uh, you think about these things. Uh, that's how you develop something that's going to be successful and something that's going to be good great my last question is uh the the funniest one because it's impossible to respond because i'm i'm asking people to answer only three people and uh and the question is who are your three favorite percussionists uh all you know any any kind of music of music confused but it's kind of impossible to only mention three And and I said I I told uh, I think Giancarlo just just uh, joking I said I, I I'm sure Poncho will say Mongo Mongo and Mongo. <laughs> <laughs> You're pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, of course you know, Mongo is number one with me. Yeah, and and and, it, and because I love the the style he played, I love the way he sounded. I love how how solid he, he had a solid sound because I used to sit right in front of him to watch him play when I was in high school at, at, at the lighthouse in Hermosa Beach, California. I was, you know, four feet from him and I could feel the the the, the power when he would yeah. slap the drum and hit the drum. It was real. I could feel it on my body when and I'd say, wow, man, what a sound, you know, and what a style. But so Mongo is uh, one of my heroes. And then, of course, I grew up meeting Mongo. And then we became very, very good close friends. And I named my oldest son after him. I have a son named Mongo. That's how much I respected him. And Mongo knew about Monguito since he was a baby. So, you know, Mongo definitely. And I love the style of music he played because he played a cross between Latin jazz, salsa, and, and Afro-Cuban music. Uh, a rumba, he did the rumba, wawanko thing, bembe, he played salsa music, and he played beautiful Latin jazz. So Mongo is, is my all-around main guy, number one, I would say. And then after that, it's hard to pick, but mm -hmm. I, I I love all the Cuban conga drummers that in, of my time, which was Mongo, Candido, uh, Patato, uh, uh, the great uh, Cuban Uh, Armando Peraza on bongos, man, what a great bongo player, you know. These great, uh, Francisco Ababella, I mean, who be, I became friends with all of these people. And they were either special guests in my performances or I played with their band. It, it worked both ways uh, with all these people. Uh, so the, the, all the great Cuban uh, percussionists of my time, I respect and love. Uh, but Mongo, and then if I had to pick another one, I'd probably say, Ray Barreto, you know, Ray, the uh, New Yorican uh, yeah. from New York, and, and all the things he did with his great, Ray Barreto always had great bands. He always, and that's what we, you were talking about, organizing things. Ray could organize good bands, and he knew music very well, so he knew how to organize groups. So he had different bands, different groups, and they were all very professional and very tight bands, you know. So Ray Barreto is uh, another one that I respect and like very, very much for, for many, many years, you know, and I got to know him and, and he, he sat in with us. I sat in with his band, you know, like, like the, all the rest of the people I uh, mentioned. And the other one, I would say my play Patato Valdez, Patato, little small Patato, man, beautiful guy. Hard to understand because he spoke so fast. He spoke really <laughs> fast. And even guys in New York, like Dandy, Uh, Dandy Rodriguez, the guys who used to hang out with him, and I would turn to Dandy. Some Dandy sometimes when he would tell me something, I go, "How do you understand this guy?" And and, and Dandy told me, "Goes nobody understands. Him. Just tell him yes. <laughs> Just say yes." <laughs> he because he talks so fast in in Spanish, right? Well, 
<laughs> so Patato was a great, it was a great melodic conga yeah. drummer, you know, very melodic. And he was the first one to use two and three congas uh, here in the United States. And so he was very melodic and Patato taught me how to tune my drums. Patato is the one that taught me how to tune my drums to E, G, C, starting with a low tumba, E, in the middle one, C, uh, E, G, C, uh, I tuned the conga to a C. Patato taught, taught me how to tune my drums that way. And Patato also taught me when I used to wear the Kango caps, I used to wear those Kango hats, you know? Yeah. He, he taught me how to wear the hat correctly. Uh, <laughs> uh, Patato, uh, uh, one time we were playing together here in California, and it was Tito Puente's band, Cal Jader's band, and Willie Bobo's band. We all played together in the same outdoor concert. And Patato see me wearing my Kango cap. I was wearing a white one, and he was wearing a white one that day. But his looked real puffy on the outside right here. Like, it was nice and full looking, very puffy. Like, wow, his hat looks beautiful. It, it looked uh, beautiful. It fit him perfect. And it was nice and puffy. And mine, mine was all plastal. You know, it was all crushed to the sides. And it didn't look as nice as his hat. And it was the same hat. So I told him, Oye, Patato, man, how do you fix your hat to look so so nice, you know? And he told me, Oye, Poncho, ven, ven. And we were in an outdoor concert, and many people were there. He goes, ven, Poncho. And I go, w -w you know, of course, everything was in Spanish. Where are you going? He goes, ven, Poncho, ven para acá. Ben. So I started following him through, you know, a crowd of people. He was going to the restroom on the other side. And I'm going, why is he going to the restroom? You know? And he said, Poncho, Ben, Ben. And I'm following little Patato, you know, he was little, like, and I'm following him. And he went to the restroom and he goes, Ben. And he goes inside the restroom. And I told him, Oye, Patato, yo, yo no me entro ahí. I'm not going in there, man. What, what are you, what are you doing? I just asked you how do you fix your hat. You're taking me to the restroom, you know? Oye, Poncho, por favor, ven. And then he went in the restroom and he went in the stall in, in the where the toilets are. And I'm going, wait a minute. I'm not going in there, Patato. <laughs> Poncho, por favor, ven, ven. And I said, man, what is this guy doing? He took his hat off and, and he said, give, give me your hat. Give me your hat. And he got the toilet paper. <laughs> and he gave the toilet paper. And he got the toilet paper out and he stuffed it all around the inside of the hat. And and I and he goes, Mira, Poncho, I see, mira. And he puts it inside his hat. And, and he goes, put it on, put it on. And I put it on. And I go, wow, se mira bien. Que bonito, man, me gusta. He taught me how to wear my hat correctly by stuffing toilet paper in there. And later on, I, I, re I realized when you buy the Kango caps, it comes with paper inside. I used to get the paper and throw it away. You get it and you form it to the outside of your hat and it keeps the sides nice and full and clean and puffy. I said, Patato, thank you so much. Ever since then, I still have some hanging in the other room and they all got, I, I use uh, 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 paper towels. You put a paper towel in there, you know, and you bend it around like this, right? <laughs> so anyway, but not only did he teach me how to do my drums, he taught me how to wear my hat correctly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, nice, nice stories. I mean, we could go through 40 chapters from your book and, and 40 more and that would that wouldn't be enough so that that's why it's a it's a good thing that you're writing down the book and we'll see later maybe a documentary will be also something else to do man because there's so many i guess there's so many uh, footage out there of shows from all around the world and this and that that there's material to do something but for sure all those Per drummers, percussionists, you mentioned. There's right there. You got many men, many information to to listen to and to study for someone who who wants to get into, you know, playing and learning about conga and 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 percussions. Right there, there's a school right there. That's it. That's right. And and that's how I learned by listening to their records and all the records that they were on. Uh, that's how I learned. And then of course. When I got old enough to go to a nightclub or to a concert, I would go see them perform when they would come to California. So that's how I learned to play by watching the 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 the, the greats, the hero, our heroes, you know. Yeah. Well, I got a very very last and and quick one, and then we gotta go because we we got 
something else to do, you know? <laughs> right, right, right. You're a busy guy. You're, re not, you're not retired, right? So. <laughs> no, no, I still got a few busy. more things to do today, you know? <laughs> uh, well, my, my question is, uh, what do you think uh, sets Moperk apart from other companies? And I, I don't want... I don't necessarily want to talk about other companies, but just what's the difference between the drums we make and the drums people can find uh, in the stores? Well, uh, uh, of course, the um, uh, very first thing I can say is, is Moperk drums are made to last. Moperk drums will probably outlive you because they're put together that well where they're not going to fall apart. Number one, the drums are made correctly and, and you use the finest quality, the finest materials to put the drums together. That's why I'm with Moperk, because I know you use the top-notch quality wood, wood glue. That's another thing. Got to have the right glues to keep that drum together uh, because we, we have experienced all these years that many other drum companies they fall apart they come apart the drums you know what i mean they crack easily they come unglued and moperk that doesn't happen with moperk so that's very important that moperk uses the highest finest quality uh equipment and 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 woods and and glues and squero skins uh, uh metals stainless steel the finest to make a drum so that right there that tells you that the drum is going to be very, very well put together. And of course, I know you've learned, Francis, in the four or five years that you've been in charge there, you've learned a lot how to make the drum correctly. And I know you're not going to go back to, to make a mistake. You're going to keep it uh, uh, top notch uh, quality. They got fi uh, fi you have a fine quality control where you check the drums personally to make sure they're great before you send them out. So. It's very important that people know that Moperk uses the finest quality materials and, and know how to put a drum together. And then this, therefore, makes the drum sound great. It has a great natural sound. It doesn't have a synthetic sound because it's made with natural wood. So, And then every type of wood, has, it, it, the sounds change uh, a little bit. Some people want ash. Some people want... Uh, uh, oak, some people want mahogany, some people want walnut. They all have a little bit different sound, but they're all a professional quality sound. That's true. Uh, I've learned a lot uh, in, in this process in, in almost five years. And and I'm lucky to, you know, that I, I took over a company that were already making top quality. And I mean, Moper has been making this for 25 years before I took over or more, Michelle Willette used to Michelle. make very good drums since the very beginning. Yep. So, so when I come and, uh, and you know, I, I, when I come and take over the company, I all I can do is just keep doing the same quality or improve it. I won't right. step back, I, just, I always step up, you know? So, you have to. So if it's not better, it's easier or quicker or, you know, clearer for for my people who work with me because they 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 got they got to be able to work in the shop and I, I can be watching every single step they 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 make but now when we start a batch of drums for sure i i, I make sure the angles are accurate and, mm -hmm. and we always check on certain steps of the of the process well like uh, also I, like i've said it before i'm glad that uh, michelle pick the right guy to continue the company because he could have picked the wrong guy because nobody knows what's going to happen. Nobody sees the future, you know? He could have picked the wrong guy and it could have been a mess, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, but, could, I could have said, oh, we're, or someone else could have said, I'm going to change everything. I'm going to change techniques yeah. and, and do this like this or, you know, but I've been very careful with that. I'm changing certain things, but just to get more precise and, and more accurate and make sure that if it's not the same, it's just better than it was, you know? And I'm sure- there's always and, and, place to, for, there's always room for improvement. Yes, and, and I'm sure that Michelle is very proud of that. And, and I'm sure he's very proud of you 
because Francis, I'm very proud of you, and I'm glad. I'm glad, and I know that you're doing an excellent job there. And I, so therefore, and I, I know Michelle. The last time I talked to Michelle when I was at at your, at your home, he's uh, very proud of you, and 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 I'm glad he picked you to uh, to run the company and to go forward with the company because Michelle, start you start off with an excellent product, and now you're continuing forward. Well, thanks, uh, Poncho, and. All I can say is uh, I wish you the best. I wish you uh, good luck and success with your new book. Can't wait to see the result. And uh, I guess you're you're preparing an upcoming record and some yeah. other projects. So you never stop, and and that's what keeps you on the fight, man. Yeah, not not. I'm not ready to stop yet. I got a few more years left, you know. But I'll let you know when. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Poncho. And uh, we'll talk soon, man. Uh, gracias, man. Thank Good you very time. much. Thank you.